Hello. Um, welcome to Earth Journalism Network um, a webinar on fishery subsidies. I'm very happy to welcome you all. Uh, I'm Paul Greenberg, um, a writer on fisheries, um, aquaculture, and the natural world on a regular basis. Um, and I'm joined today by a really great uh, panel of experts, including Daniel Skerritt, uh, Anna Schubauer, and Kat Millage, which I'll um, introduce it more fully in a moment. Um, but first, some housekeeping issues. Um, thank you so much for joining again. Um, we're going to be talking about um, ongoing uh, negotiations that the World Trade Organization is conducting around the whole question of fishery subsidies. Um, we do um, want you guys to participate, uh, those of you who are listening in. Um, we want your, your questions. We'd love to field them. Um, and um, we ask that if you're going to submit questions, you do them through the Q&A. Uh, feature on the um, on Zoom, and drop them to Q and A, and I will read them out loud and um, ask the panelists and direct them accordingly. Um, if you would like to um, get more involved in what the Earth Journalism Network is doing, if you you go you can go to earthjournalism.net and you can sign up to join. And um, we'll drop in little information throughout the uh, throughout the discussion um, about this issue and about ways that you can stay. Um, in touch with all of all of us and 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 continue the discussion beyond this webinar. Um, we're going to go um, roughly for an hour today. If there's intense interest interest to continue, we can probably go 90 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but I think that's basically it for the technical aspect. Um, let's talk about the subject itself um, before I introduce the panelists. Um, I think um, right now, if you're on this panel, there's a good chance that one of the things that brought you to it. Um, is the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy, um, which uh, is probably, um, you know, I think it's a very controversial documentary, but it does bring to light um, a number of things and brings it a spotlight into the whole question of overfishing, of sea slavery, uh, of all these different things that we perceive as going wrong with the ocean. Um, I think a lot of people got very fired up. A lot of people came to me that were completely out of sight, outside what I think of as the fish echo chamber suddenly saying, oh my gosh, what are we gonna possibly do um, about fisheries and, um, and how can we fix the ocean? How can we address all those things? Um, of course, uh, films, um, especially ones uh, engineered to gain an effect are often sort of breeze past the facts and also oftentimes um, get us sort of more excited than necessarily informed. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, the actual mechanics that drive things like overfishing and sea, sea slavery um, and all these kinds of habitat degradation issues are often sort of below the radar. And that's why we have invited you to come to this, I think, very important webinar uh, on a topic that at first glance might seem a little humdrum, a little bit bureaucratic, but it's actually one of the major engines that's driving uh, overfishing today. Um, fishery subsidies, um, I think they're, we're talking about in the order of $34 billion annually, and my panels will probably correct that or maybe tweak that a little bit. Um, but um, they are the one of the major drivers towards um, over overfishing towards overcapacity of fishing boats um, and fishing fleets on the oceans today. But I would say that there's a kind of more um, philosophical bent to this whole thing, which is that I think what fishery subsidies really do is cause us to devalue or undervalue the natural world. Because in effect, what fishery subsidies do is make it too cheap to fish and, and make it too easy to overexploit and to undervalue um, these natural systems that while seemingly very large and robust, are actually quite fragile. So we're going to try and get into this um, uh, through a number of different angles. Um, and um, I'm going to let the panelists, who are much more expert on this topic than I am, uh, kind of break it down. But I'll introduce our panelists once again um, and just give you a quick idea of what each of them is going to talk about. Um, first up is going to be um, Daniel Skerritt. Um, Daniel is a postdoctoral research fellow um, at the Fisheries Economics Research Unit at the University of British Columbia. Um, he sports work on socioeconomic analysis of fisheries, global fisheries subsidies, and how societal knowledge can be transposed into sustainable policy. And Daniel's going to talk more broadly about the whole fishery subsidy question on a national or an international level. Um, Anna Schubauer um, is a fishery scientist, um, postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for, the Ocean, for Oceans and Fishery at the University of British Columbia. 
Um, she's worked far and wide um, in, in northern Peru, in the Falkland Islands, in the Galapagos. Um, she originally focused on the ecological aspects of fisheries, but she turned in her PH work to focus more on small scale fisheries and their economic viability, which, as you'll see from her presentation, is really a kind of key question uh, that we'll be looking at this question of large scale fisheries versus small scale fisheries. Um, and then last, um, but certainly not least, is Kat Millage. Um, she's a project research researcher at the Environmental Market Solutions Lab at the University of California at Santa Barbara, a wonderful institution that really does great work. Um, she has developed a bioeconomic model to examine the impacts of seafood certification programs designed for small scale fisheries. And her research interests include bioeconomic modeling, aquaculture, innovative data poor stock assessment methods, and ways in which data science can facilitate easier accessibility to and sharing of fisheries data. And Kat's going to kind of bring us up to date on where we are in the WTO fishery subsidy uh, negotiation process and give you an idea of sort of where, how you can follow it, especially if you're a journalist tuning in here today. So um, let's, um, if we're all ready to go, um, let's start with Daniel. Um, you're gonna give us kind of an idea of, of what these fishery subsidies are, what they mean for the ocean, um, how we got into this mess to some degree. So Daniel, if you're gonna share your screen, so go ahead and I'll take it away. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. Just to move that out there. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, today, as, as, as you mentioned, I'm going to provide a brief overview of what fishery subsidies are, how they differ from other forms of subsidization in, in other sectors, and some of the key impacts that they can have on sustainability. Uh, firstly, before we start, it's important to define what we mean by a subsidy. The definition that's used by the WTO and also by many others uh, has these three basic elements, all of which must be satisfied for a subsidy to exist. They are that there is either a direct or indirect financial contribution from government or any public body to the private sector, and that that contribution confers some kind of benefit to the sector. Okay. Now, there are, there are probably about kind of three broad reasons why we might transfer public money to the private sector. Kind of uh, the first is to incentivize sectoral development in a way that may not otherwise occur. So, for example, you might want to encourage investment in renewable energy and provide subsidies for that. The second is to address social equity issues, such as increasing the wages of marginalized workers. And um, Anna will kind of touch more on that later. And the third is to address conservation concerns, such as encouraging landowners to plant native crops. Again, you might provide subsidies for that. These broad justifications are all well and good, but as you'll hear today, subsidies don't always achieve these, these goals and can in fact have quite profound negative impacts. Subsidies can cause harm by distorting markets, contributing to unfair trade practices, or creating unequal competition. Most of these harms are, are known as trade injuries and essentially focused on domestic or international economies and, and then subsequent social impacts. These kind of harms are mitigated to some extent by WTO pro prohibitions on certain forms of subsidy or through actions taken by one member of WTO against another. Fishery subsidies, however, are a, a kind of a special case, as well as leading or potentially leading to these trade injuries, they can also cause ecological harm. Now they do this through, through the act of increasing production. So when you provide a subsidy to increase production, that very acting fishing causes further ecological harm. If unchecked, this leads to overcapacity, which essentially is too many fishing boats for the amount of fish available to catch. And ultimately that can lead to overfishing. So that's taking too many fish out of the ocean. And this effect is at the very centre of these negotiations, this capacity enhancing uh, effect. And we can demonstrate how subsidies can exacerbate or lead to overfishing using a series of well-known studies. Uh, the first here shows the global catch of seafood over the last 60 years or so. It has the reported catch in the grey line and the reconstructed catch in the dark black line, which essentially just takes account of illegal fishing or unreported fishing or discards. But importantly, what we see uh, if I use the, is a steady increase in catch as fisheries became more industrialized, peaking around the mid 1990s 
And then since then, we've seen either a lev leveling off or potentially a slight decline in catches in recent decades. But importantly, we're still seeing very large amounts of fish being caught every year. Now, if we keep that in mind when we consider this second study, this shows fish biomass, so tons per square kilometre in the Northern Atlantic in, in around 1900. You can see well-known hotspots of biomass along the Grand Banks of Eastern Canada and the US, the North Sea, uh, the West Coast of Europe, all the way down to, to North Africa. So these are areas where there's, where there's high, large amounts of fish present. But if we fast forward 100 years, uh, and due to you know, the increase in fishing during that time, and other impacts, but we now see much lower biomass of fish overall, particularly at these uh, those heavily fished hotspots, where biomass is reduced by tenfold. And this is true across much of the world's ocean. So the alarming thing is, is that despite these huge reductions in fish biomass, we're still seeing relatively high catches of fish each year. So how can catches remain high while the amount of fish available to catches decrease? The answer is that we've had to put in more effort. We have to work a lot harder to catch the same amount of fish. These data from West Africa illustrate the point perfectly. I'll quickly work through them. In order to maintain, maintain these high catches while biomass is reducing in the, in the, in the region, we have, to, we have to work much harder. We have to put in more effort. So in order to keep those catches high, we spend longer at sea, fish further offshore and out into deeper water. But as we increase our effort, we also increase the costs of fishing. Yet our revenue, that is the catch, the, the fish that we catch, is at best staying the same. So clearly that's not sustainable, neither biologically, because if biomass keeps reducing, we'll, we'll run out of fish, nor economically, because we can't keep increasing our costs while our, our revenues essentially stay the same. Eventually, a limit will be reached. And this is where fishery subsidies can come in by artificially reducing the cost of fishing or increasing the revenues from fishing, they essentially support fishing beyond what would otherwise be unsustainable or unprofitable. Uh, and that's where these uh, negotiations are, are what one part of the negotiations are focusing on, prohibiting subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. In other words, those capacity enhancing subsidies. However, it's important just to note that not all fishery subsidies are in fact harmful. Uh, we consider there to be three broad types. So those capacity enhancing, those harmful subsidies, the ones that artificially reduce or increase profits, things such as fuel subsidies or tax exemptions. We also consider there to be beneficial subsidies, things that aim to promote conservation in the resource itself. So investments in marine protected areas, for example, which still have a, have a, have a benefit to the sector by, by increasing the amount of fish available to, to catch. And there's also ambiguous subsidies, uh, those where the impact is, is less certain. So using this classification, these three broad types of subsidies, our research group at UBC created back in 2000 and maintains a global database of fishery subsidies. Our most recent estimates show that in 2018, more than 35 billion US dollars of fishery subsidies were provided globally. The important section is this, is this red section. So uh, just over 60% of those were estimated to be harmful, capacity enhancing subsidies. Those that, you know, the, the, the latter part of the negotiations are targeting for prohibition. We've extended this research in, in various ways, which uh, Anna will certainly cover, and I think Kat may as well later. So using this, uh, this database as a kind of platform. And through various other studies that kind of spin off studies, our research has shown that the majority of fishery subsidies are harmful, this section in red. They're being provided by rich countries, particularly in Asia, North America, and Europe. They're mostly supporting the large scale industrialized fishing fleet, particularly those fish that fishing, those fishing vessels that fish in distant waters and, and particularly in the high seas as well. We do, however, see a number of arguments against subsidies reform. So this is why the negotiations have been taking 20 years. Um, I'll briefly discuss and hopefully debunk two of these, two of the most prominent uh, kind of excuses here. But you, can, you can look at this paper here by a colleague to, to see a few more. So the first is that these harmful subsidies are important for supporting fishers and alleviating poverty. So, I mean, 
we can debunk this for several reasons why it's not true. The first is that harmful subsidies incentivize overfishing, especially in regions where fisheries management is weaker, particularly in developing nations. So by providing capacity enhancing subsidies, we're actually eroding the resources these coastal communities rely on. So removing harmful subsidies could actually result in more fish available to those fishers, more profitable fisheries, and, 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 and increase food security further. Secondly, as we know, and as Anna will explain to you further and convince you if I don't, uh, that the majority of these subsidies are being provided to large scale industrialized fishing fleets by rich countries. So subsidies do not help poor people, like categorically we can prove this. Uh, so it's important to note that often as academics, we're not arguing for this money to be taken out of these com communities completely. What we're arguing for is that they shouldn't be provided support in the form of capacity enhancing subsidies. We should be providing support uh, via in, in means that have long term sustainability in, in mind and don't undermine the, sus uh, the sustainability of the fish stocks, but actually increase the sustainability while supporting fisheries. Fishers. OK, so the second myth is that overcapacity and overfishing is a local issue and doesn't require international commitment. Now, as we know, fish stocks don't respect boundaries. You hear this all the time. They move between different jurisdictions, between different states, out into the high seas. Increasingly, so do the fishing vessels that chase them. Uh, you may have heard of like distant water fishing vessels, these fishing access agreements. And so our ocean, the fish and the fishers that it supports are all interconnected. Inter international cooperation is essential. The, the, the changes that you make in, in one part of the ocean have knock-on effects to others. Think of it a bit like the carbon emissions and climate change problem. What one country does can affect us all. And we have some new analysis on this, which I think Anna will share to convince you further. Okay, I'm noticing the time. So to, to summarize here, uh, broadly speaking, fishery subsidies differ from other subsidies in that they can also cause ecological harm by allowing fishing to go beyond biological or economic limits, at which point they would usually have to stop. The harm that fishery subsidies cause is not confined to domestic waters, meaning multilateral action is, ne is a necessity. Fishery subsidies are often harmful, but not always. Beneficial subsidies can and perhaps should continue to be provided to the sector, but they should not undermine the resources that the sector rely and we rely on or unfairly impact other nations. Fishery subsidies are, are very complex. They're often clouded by confusing layers of bureaucracy and sometimes disingenuous labeling and reporting by nations. Despite these difficulties when reporting fishery subsidies, it's important not to lose the context and accuracy for the sake of simplicity. The point, in, the point perfectly is, is about the fact that there are actually beneficial subsidies and harmful subsidies. So hopefully that gave you quite a good overview of uh, what fishery subsidies are, how they differ, and touches on some of the sustainability issues that my colleagues will, will go into further. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, that was really interesting. You know, it's funny, I think in this era of big data, we're used to seeing these kind of graphs fly by and say, oh, it's just more numbers. But something that is just such a slap in the face is that slide where you showed um, the uh, abundance of fish in 1900 versus today and just seeing literally whole colors disappear from the map. I mean, if you needed to be uh, uh, given documentation of the true effect of this kind of stuff, there it is right there. Um, also, I want to you know, just point out one thing, and it'll probably come up in the rest of the conversation, but in some of the papers, Daniel, that you sent me in advance, um, it was noted that something like seven billion of uh, the dollars put into subsidies are actually fuel subsidies. Um, which, which actually lock in outdated technology, which turns out actually is a climate issue on top of everything. So I thought that was pretty interesting and we'll probably do delve into that deeper, but I wanna to get to the other panelists. So Anna Schubert is up next. Um, she's gonna to talk to us about this small scale fisheries issue, how it relates um, to the overall uh, subsidies uh, picture um, and give us an idea of how to some degree we might rebalance this, right? Yes, thank you, Paul. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, so hi, everybody. My name is Anna Schubauer, and um, thanks, uh, Paul, for the nice introduction earlier. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. 
I'm very honored to be speaking here and I'm really looking forward to our Q&A session later and discussing and having some interesting question like Dan I only have 10 minutes to summarize work we have been carrying out over the last few years so um, I'm hoping to give you a good um, summary here. So first of all, yeah, so my talk title is the global fishery subsidy divide. So I'm going to talk a little bit more into how this is impacting or benefiting the different sectors within uh, gl our global fisheries um, sector system. And um, first of all, I'm just going to highlight a little bit what we're meaning by subsectors. And um, so we have the large scale um, fishing sector. And we're just talking about marine capture fishery here. And um, so the large scale sector is mainly industrial fishing fleets, big boats, big trawlers. Um, it's, there's not like a global definition to divide those sectors, but we cannot work with how the different countries divide um, the different um, fishing fleets. And then within the large scale sector, we have the industrial domestic sector, which fishes within their own territorial waters. And Daniel kind of um, talked about this a little bit already, but I'm um, just kind of to highlight and, and put this into context as well. So the distant water fleet means that um, those are all fishing fleets that fish in somebody else's territorial waters. So um, in somebody else's um, neighboring um, territorial water or um, a across the whole world in, in another country's um, fishing zone. And then the high seas are without jurisdiction. So those are all the, the ocean that is open for anybody to fish in. And then we have the small scale sector. So those are usually the small boats, uh, subsistence for their um, fishing for their own home consumption or for their household and their artisanal fleet. So that can vary quite a bit as well. There can be small canoes, but also bigger motorized boats, but with more manual um, gear, fishing gear that they use. And so small scale fisheries across the world are really important. 30% uh, of our global landed value um, from marine capture fisheries comes from the small scale sector. They produce about two thirds of fish caught for direct human consumption. And um, they support um, over 100 million livelihoods um, across the world. So they're very important for um, coastal community, for food security as well, and for other aspects. Um, however, small scale fisheries across the world are underrepresented. They are politically and economically marginalized. Their voices are not heard. Um, they're often isolated from global markets. Um, and they're also understudied. They're often overlooked in global data sets. So because it's harder to collect information from small scale fisheries, they're more scattered across the, the, the countries and um, that don't have the same systems where data is being collected. And, um, but it's really important to distinguish between those sectors because we can't have like a policy or management scheme for a large scale fishing sector that is vastly different from a small scale fishing sector. So it's really important to separate these um, Issue, uh, these sectors because they have different issues and different needs. And then also they are threatened and they're threatened mostly by large scale processes of change. So that could be climate change. Um, we know research has been done that shows how especially tropical countries, um, fisheries are a lot more um, harmed by current climate change, by temperature rising in the oceans, um, by fish migrating towards the poles. And then also by global market shifts, top-down management is a big issue as well. And also the COVID-19 pandemic has actually threatened and impacted, especially the small scale fishing sector due to um, food security issues where um, the local trade chains have not um, continued to work very well. So there's quite a few research, research studies coming out. Um, so yeah, despite them being so important, they are quite um, vulnerable as well. And so one of our biggest um, projects that we've been working on is to look into how much of those fisheries subsidies actually goes to the small scale sector compared to the large scale sector. So just kind of to keep in mind, we are looking here at the whole world. So we're kind of zooming out. So this is not like a study where each country was studied specifically, but we gathered all the information across the whole world. And like I said, for the small scale sector, sometimes it's a little bit harder to find information because it's not out there. So here in the map, you can see all the countries in dark gray are the countries where we found data that um, we could really like 
work with and in the other countries there was just um, a, a bigger lack of data so we had to like build a model and fill the gaps with using averages from other regions and um, using some of the catch data we had available to kind of understand who gets which of these subsidies. Um, and so our big outcome, our big results show that 19% of the 35.4 billion US dollars that are provided as subsidies to the world go to the small scale sector and 81% go to the large scale sector. So these are big percentages and numbers, but what does this really mean? So we kind of looked into this a little bit more and um, found out that we look by number of fisher, that a large scale fisher receives around four times more money than a small scale um, fisher. If we um, look into the available numbers, um, this is a very conservative estimate. It might be much higher because like I said, the small scale sector does not have that much information. We know, for example, women in fishery are um, not counted often in the fishing statistics and they make up a large percentage. So um, that might be even more. And then we also looked into the dollar landed. So two times more when looking into the subsidy per dollar land, it goes into the large scale sector compared to the small scale sector. And so this is a huge inequity and it clearly undermines the economic viability of the small scale sector. So the long term um, like livelihoods and sustaining the small scale fishing sector is threatened by these uneven distribution of subsidies. Um, so like Daniel said, not all subsidies are necessarily bad subsidies. So he just showed you the graph of this for the whole world. We split this up into the large and the small scale. So the size of the pie charts shows you the difference between kind of the amount provided. But if we just kind of look at the proportion, so 64% go to the large scale sector that are capacity enhancing subsidies that are harmful fishing subsidies and that contribute um, to overcapacity, that contribute to overfishing, to illegal fishing and have negative effects on the environment, on fish production and the fishing and fishing incomes across the world as well. And um, it's interesting to see the small scale sector, the percentage is very similar. So even the small scale sector receives quite a large percentage of the harmful fishery subsidies, which also undermine and the same way the resource base as the large scale fishing um, harmful subsidies. But also important to note that the biggest share of the whole global picture are harmful fishing subsidy that go to the large scale sector. And so um, the next graph I'm showing you, this is just preliminary results. Daniel, um, Rashid Sumail and I have been um, working on. So I'd like you not to tweet the next slide, please, um, as this is not published yet. So if you don't mind just having a look with me without actually showing this to anybody else yet. Um, so you get the first peek in our ideas here. And so what we did, we looked at only the harmful fishery subsidies, which are $22.2 billion in total. And again, like I mentioned earlier, the small scale sector receives um, a, a smaller percentage. So this is 3.9 billion and the large scale sector receives 18 0.4 billion. But if we look into, the, into these 18.4 billion that the large scale, the industrial sector receives, we split this up based on cat shares in different um, territorial waters. So where do these um, fishing fleets actually go? So 10.6 of this um, is actually within the domestic um, territorial waters. So if a country provides the fishery subsidies, uh, a percentage goes to their own waters. But $6.6 .6 billion goes to distant waters. So that means that 6.6 .6 billion fishery subsidies are provided for the fishing fleets to fish in somebody else's waters. And this is clearly showing what Daniel was mentioning that it's not just, subsidies are not just of national concern. They are of international concern. They are impacting other countries' waters, right? So we don't only have to look into who's providing these fishing subsidies, but also who actually is impacted, whose ecosystem is actually impacted by these subsidies the most. And then we also have um, quite a high percentage of the subsidies that go to the high seas. So these are going in, 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 in waters that are often poorly managed um, through large agreements between different countries, 
I mean, some a little bit better these days, but there's just not the same policing. There's just not the same um, monitoring happening, um, what's going on with the fisheries in these waters. So um, now, yeah, so this is an additional issue that we can see. <clears throat> And so just to come to conclusion, also I'm just seeing the time. Um, so yeah, so the majority of uh, subsidies are directed as harmful subsidies towards the big industrial fishing fleet. Um, also what we found out when we look into the beneficial subsidies that the small scale fishing sector actually receives the lowest share of, of beneficial subsidies. So those are subsidies towards management and research and monitoring, and especially the small scale fishing sector in the low HDI countries, in the poorer countries. And then, like I just mentioned, around 35% of all harmful subsidies are provided to enable fishing fleets to fish either in foreign countries' waters or in the high seas. And as we just um, heard over and over again, those harmful fishery subsidies erode the resource base of those coastal communities um, on which they depend on. So there's really no way to paint this any other way than um, clearly showing how harmful, harmful subsidies are not doing anybody any good. And then, so yeah, therefore the idea is to reduce and eliminate those harmful fishing subsidies across all fishing sectors. So even the small scale fishing sector does not need to receive any of those subsidies that undermine their own resource base. Um, we need to have food security and the maintenance of livelihoods should be in the foreground, which also is undermined by harmful fishery subsidies. And then also the ideas are, what can we do, right? We can use those funds. It doesn't mean the governments should stop paying towards um, helping, but they should fund um, project with long-term goals in mind to work on projects for coastal communities. That could be towards healthcare, that could be um, towards community infrastructure, um, education, you name it. There's so many things that might just need more money and help these communities to get out of poverty um, than fishery subsidies, right? And we want to achieve social equity, economic viability and resilience for those communities. So those threats that they're facing through climate change, they can be standard. Um, and luckily, there are some good agreements happening. The FAO has a good small scale fisheries guidelines now that are um, towards poverty alleviation. Um, the United Nations development goals talk about fishing subsidies and talking about small scale fishing sector. So um, we're moving in the in the right direction. And um, Kat Milic now will give you some insights into the current World Trade Organization negotiations and um, how these can also move into the right direction if um, this is going to be pushed um, forward, hopefully. So thanks everybody. Um, sorry, I went a couple minutes over. That's okay. Thanks, thanks Anna, that was really great. You know, I think um, it's funny as a reporter and I should point out um, uh, the Earth Generalism Network is going to be giving out a few small story grants um, more than a few actually uh, for people who want to continue covering this subject but what I think is really interesting is that there are endless baroque permutations of how um, large-scale fisheries try to evade our scrutiny on these questions um, I always think about here in New York um, there's been a big move in the United States to move to com community supported fisheries and that's def definitely a positive thing but I remember when all the press was going on about that the Fulton fish market here in New York City which is the biggest wholesaler of all this international stuff coming in suddenly started this website for uh, their art their artisan fishermen with network kind of thing but it was just still the same stuff just repackaged in a different form. And I think that we all as journalists and as just public people need to understand that this there's always this kind of chameleon-like thing that's going on with large scale fisheries, trying to slip under the kind of good feeling small scale fisheries umbrella and evade our, our scrutiny. So let's go to the little, speaking of scrutiny, let's look a little bit um, at what's the current state of play with these negotiations. And, and Kat has, Kat Millage has been following this pretty intensively over the last few, well, years and, and particularly months, but I guess it's all kind of gone virtual during this period of time, but, but lead us through where we are and, and, and what the next steps are. I think you're muted there. There you yep. go. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. All right, so everybody should be able to see this. Um, hello, my name is Kat Millage. I'm at the Environmental Market Solutions Lab at UC Santa Barbara. 
Um, and as, as mentioned, I'm going to touch a little bit more on the argument for reforming fisheries subsidies, um, why we would want to do that, what some of the challenges are, and then provide a, a brief high level overview of the history of the WTO negotiations, as well as where things stand now. So first, the, why we would want to reform fisheries subsidies, building on what Daniel presented earlier, the economic argument for doing so is actually really simple. Since most of these capacity enhancing subsidies are artificially lowering fishing costs or increasing revenues, if we took away those subsidies or reformed those subsidies, we would expect fishing costs to increase slightly in the short term, which would ultimately result in less fishing. And if those decreases in fishing effort continued, um, this would give stocks, fish stocks the chance to rebound, ultimately resulting in increased catches. Of course, this is fisheries, so nothing is actually as simple as, as it seems. And so I wanted to quickly touch on a couple of real world uh, factors that might change those potential effects of reforming subsidies, not to make the argument that we shouldn't reform subsidies, but to give you a little bit more context behind why the WTO has spent so much time negotiating this issue and really what some of the key concerns that are being, being considered are. So two of these factors in the real world that could, could have an effect on reforming fisheries subsidies are the type of subsidy being provided and the form in which it's being provided, which Daniel touched on a little bit already, as well as the role of fisheries management when thinking about what effect a fisheries subsidy is actually going to have. There are, of course, many other real world factors that play a role when thinking about reforming fisheries subsidies, things like fishers objectives, compliance with regulations, um, and on. So first, touching again on the different types of subsidies and the form in which they're provided. As Daniel pointed out, not all types of subsidies have the same effect on incentivizing overcapacity or overfishing and therefore not the same effect on fish stocks. Um, this, this figure is from some work done by the OECD, looking at six specific types of fisheries subsidies and looking at their effects on uh, stock size. So the amount Kat, of fish that are in the water. Kat, can I interrupt you for a second? I think you're not in presentation mode on your slides. So we're just still seeing the first slide only. So if you go oh. to view, if you go to view slideshow, I am on my end. Are other people able to see the additional slides? Or no? Yeah. Sorry about that, folks. You want to just relaunch? Or we, uh, there you go. And you want to try and advance the slide? There you go. Great. So, sorry about that. I no apologize. Problem. No problem. I, you were you were very captivating in your voice, so we didn't necessarily need <laughs> the slide. Well, we didn't miss much. Um, so this this figure on this side is showing some work done by the OECD, where they looked at the relative effects of different types of fisheries subsidies. So this is just so showing six types of, of fishery subsidies and looking at the effects that those types of subsidies have on, in this case, uh, fish stock size. And so seeing here that all of these subsidy types have a negative effect, meaning they're causing a decrease in the size of the fish stock, but that they affect the fish stock to differing degrees. So as Daniel mentioned, thinking about the, the type of fishery subsidies is going to be important when you're thinking about reforming them and how you define those subsidies also becomes very important. 
Um, the second piece related to this is the way in which a subsidy can be provided and who it's provided to, as Anna touched on, can also impact the effects that it'll have. Um, for example, small scale versus large scale fishers face different, very different types of costs and cost structures. And so different types of subsidies actually have different effects on their behavior. And so this piece also plays a role when thinking about reforming fishery subsidies, uh, because there are ways in which you can provide subsidies, as both Daniel and Anna mentioned, that don't actually incentivize overcapacity and overfishing. The second piece I wanted to quickly touch on that's kind of a confounding real world effect when you're thinking about reforming fishery subsidies is the role that management plays. And this is a big, a big topic that has come up in the WTO negotiations. And I do want to highlight that truly effective fisheries management can mitigate the effects of capacity enhancing subsidies. But as shown by this plot, we added a second row here in dark blue that's showing the same, same information, the effects of six types of subsidies on fish stock size, but under a heavily regulated scenario where the total catch is, is highly regulated in that fishery. And you can see that that does indeed mitigate the, the negative effect on the fish stock slightly, but that there is still an effect. So again, I, I raise these issues not to argue that we shouldn't reform certain types of fishery subsidies, but just to provide a, a little more context for the types of issues that the WTO is considering. So now jumping into a brief history on, on the WTO fishery subsidies negotiations, as Daniel mentioned, subsidies are ultimately a trade issue. So the World Trade Organization, uh, which has 164 members and an additional, ad additional 25 governments that observe the policies and recommendations that it sets out, is truly an international organiza organization that's well, well posed to tackle this issue of subsidies. And Fishery subsidies negotiations at the WTO are not in any way a new issue. The WTO actually started working on this as early as 2001, when they issued a directive to clarify and improve their existing disciplines on fisheries subsidies. And a first round of negotiations towards crafting a global agreement actually kicked off in 2005 but then stalled in 2011. And this latest round of fisheries subsidies negotiations began in 2015 when nine groups of WTO members submitted proposals with new potential disciplines. And the real, real meat of this second round of negotiations kicked off uh, at the ministerial conference in Buenos Aires in 2017 and has really continued throughout 2018, 2019, and was intended to reach a conclusion at the ministerial conference in June, 2020. Um, but obviously that conference never happened. So the WTO is now shooting to reach an agreement this year in 2021, potentially as soon as June on this issue. Um, there are a few components of what this potential WTO agreement will look like that I felt are worth touching on. The first kind of bucket of potential disciplines or rules on what types of subsidies could be provided is specifically focused on subsidies to illegal, unreported and unregulated or IUU fishing. And that bucket of potential disciplines seems to have a lot of agreement amongst WTO members. Most members agree that IUU fishing should not be subsidized and that there should be safeguards in place to make sure that IUU vessels and operators do not have access to fisheries subsidies. But a big question that's come up with this bucket of potential disciplines is who actually makes those IUU determinations? 
whether it be national organizations, international organizations, and how do you deal with the fact that most IUU vessels uh, move across boundaries and often are fishing beyond the jurisdictions of any state. The second bucket of potential disciplines that the WTO is negotiating concerns subsidies to fishing on overfished stocks. So there's some agreement amongst members that stocks that are already in an overfish condition, that means that they're being fished beyond the level that would be biologically sustainable, uh, should not continue to receive subsidies. But some, some questions that have been hampering negotiations on this topic is the question of how to identify which stocks are overfished or how to define overfishing. And obviously that question relates a lot to data availability across different reason, regions. In some regions, we have a lot more data and information regarding the health of the fish stock and in others we don't. And a related question uh, related to this category of potential disciplines is which reference points do you then use to identify an overfish stock? What is that threshold at which you would consider a stock to be overfished? And then finally, the, the third category of potential disciplines Daniel already touched on earlier. And this category is really the the major one of a potential agreement since subsidies concerning overfishing and overcapacity are really those that are at the, at the base of this issue. So this category of potential disciplines really seeks to prohibit these types of subsidies. Um, but a couple of questions that have come up here are which types of subsidies do you consider in this? As Daniel touched on, defining these subsidies is often a, a, difficult, um, a difficult task and every country provides or calls their subsidy programs different things. So coming up with, with a comprehensive pool of which types of subsidies actually fall under this category of disciplines isn't as straightforward as it might seem. And negotiators have also been thinking about different approaches here for, for dealing with these subsidies. Do you make a list of subsidy types that should be prohibited or do you use a different type of approach such as a cap or a limit um, to control the, the amount of subsidies that countries could provide? So those three, three buckets are kind of the major components of what a potential WTO agreement on reforming fishery subsidies will look like. There are many others. Another big component of an agreement is going to be the role of special and differential treatment for developing and least developed country members, um, including additional specific provisions for LDC members. There's also other aspects of this agreement, such as the role of technical assistance and capacity building across countries, um, countries' obligations in terms of notifying the WTO in the future about their subsidy programs and providing transparency there, as well as there's other provisions on institutional factors and definitions um, and stuff like that. So that's very high level overview of what a potential WTO agreement might look like. Um, and there are still challenges that, that remain on the negotiating front, uh, particularly that a WTO agreement will require consensus to be reached among all members. And there are a lot of points of disagreement there that members are still, still grappling with. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the WTO does have a draft agreement kind of built around those pillars that I mentioned. And so the, the major components and structure of an agreement are largely decided on. So in conclusion, quickly to wrap up, um, what can you do? I, now is a great time with all of the media attention that Paul, Paul mentioned to really encourage your country's policymakers to do certain things related to fisheries subsidies. 
first recommendation for, for policymakers is to be ambitious. As both of my fellow panelists have mentioned, fisheries are globally interconnected. This isn't an issue contained to any one area or place. And so the more ambitious of an agreement that we can reach in terms of fishery subsidies, the greater its impacts are going to be. Second, there are ways to still provide aid to fishing communities. There are ways to repurpose existing subsidies to ease that transition. And those avenues should be, should be fully considered and are a great alternative to capacity enhancing subsidies. And then finally, there's an opportunity here to promote cross-country technical and financial assistance. And that piece is, is linked to my final recommendation, which is to encourage policy makers to simultaneously reform fisheries management in areas where it's lacking. And so there are many well-managed fisheries out there, but there are also many fisheries where management could be improved. And this this presents an opportunity to really enhance the, the effects of reforming fisheries subsidies by simultaneously reforming management. So with that, thank you. And I will stop sharing slides. Great, thank you, Kat. Um, that was really interesting. Um, well, let's dive in. Um, we do have a number of questions on the Q&A um, and I wanna just address one of them that was uh, a technical question, which is, um, how can people get a hold of this uh, information after the fact? The webinar is being recorded, and if you registered, um, whether you're on the chat or not, and whether you're on the call or not, you will get emailed a copy of the uh, webinar presentation. Um, individual presentations we generally don't make available, um, but you know you can um, you possibly ask question via the earthjournalism.net site if you desperately need the individual presentation. But let's get to the questions. Um, this one I thought was sort of interesting from an anonymous attendee. Um, how exactly do we differentiate between beneficial and capacity enhancing subsidies? And what exactly are the objectives and features behind one subsidy being beneficial and the other one being capacity enhanced or harmful? So I realize we've kind of covered that, but I mean, it is a question in my mind too. What, you know, where's the, where's the borderline? Like, you know, what are you gonna say? That's capacity enhancing, none of that. Like where, where's the borderline? And any of you, any of the panelists jump in to answer. Me to jump in, Dan. Okay. Um. Yeah. So it's a really good question, and um, we actually have developed these categories over um a lot of years with a lot of people together because they were first defined. Um, I think, uh, through the World Trade Organization, maybe even, and then those definitions have changed a little bit, and so it's been kind of a, a long history of how these are defined, and I think still different organizations still define them slightly different. So just so you understand, we have three overarching categories, the ambiguous, the beneficial, and the capacity enhancing subsidies, and each one of those has their own sub or their own types within, and then there's subtypes within those. So it gets quite complex. So um, we've actually, in our paper, we usually define it quite clearly so everybody can refer to, to what exactly it means. Just kind of to try to explain it in general, and especially how we work at the University of British Columbia. So I think we kind of developed our own specific categories because we look into each country's uh, fishery subsidies to get our global picture, right? So we need to really find out like what are they subsidizing and what does this mean? And in which category and which type it fits. And this needs to be the exact same mechanism throughout the board, right? So we can't do it for one country one way and the other country another way. So it has to be like a very clear structure how this can work. And so basically capacity enhancing subsidies well, let's maybe start with the beneficial ones. They're a little bit easier. So beneficial subsidies are anything that's to do with management, monitoring, anything to do with research, and um, anything to do with marine protected areas, for example, or something that helps um, the ecosystem um, benefit from these subsidies. And our categorization is very focused on the biological sustainability of the fish stock. So if the subsidy that is provided can harm the biological sustainability of the fish stock, it is capacity enhancing. So it undermines 
um, the resource base. And if it's positive for the fish stock, it would be a beneficial subsidy. So this is kind of how this all started. So it's not necessarily from a social perspective, it is more from an ecological perspective. Um, does this make sense? Does anybody yeah. want to add something to this? Can I just quick, quickly add, yeah. So um, the other important aspect is that when we're doing this research, what's quite difficult is that because we're doing it globally across 152 countries, we have to look at often the, the policy, the regulation itself. And sometimes the intentions and the outcomes of the subsidy aren't always the same. And so <laughs> there will be kind of errors in some of that, you know, where we might classify something as one thing, but in fact, you know, it might end up being beneficial or harmful. Um, and that's just because, you know, you can go out with the intention for a subsidy. And, and as I said, the outcome can be the same. So this has happened throughout. So there's examples where you might want to uh, install new engines to create more carbon efficient fishing engines, but also, you know, which might be beneficial, but at the same time you've created uh, a more efficient fish catching machine, right? So, so the intentions and the outcomes aren't always uh, the same and that makes it very difficult to, to do. Um, just to, you know, I want to just get to one question. I think it's a quickie um, question for Dr. Scarrett, but I think to all of you, in which category of subsidies would you place housing provided to artisanal fishers or free education to their children? And do such subsidy, subsidies actually exist? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we would probably classify that as, I think, ambiguous. Uh, we do have a list in one of our uh, papers from 2019 of how we classify all these and, and, and it breaks it down to, to the types of subsidy and the subtypes. And so things like uh, rural community development, we would consider as ambiguous in that, you know, again, the intentions may be good and probably the outcome would be good in that, you know, that kind of support won't lead to a direct increase in fishing capacity. But as I say, some of those we classify as ambiguous because if it allows them, you know, people to, to invest more money, for example, in, in, in a better fishing boat because you've, you've taken away a cost from somewhere else, uh, you know, it could lead to increased fishing capacity. So some of those more uh, community based things we would we would classify as ambiguous, which means it's not it's not one or the other. We can't tell without, you know, doing a case study in that country and that specific subsidy, which uh, for our kind of work is just not possible. Yeah, whereas free education wouldn't be a fishing subsidy anyway, for example. OK, like if it's specifically for the fishing community and it helps them like if it's just a social subsidy to help the community, it's not necessarily categorized within our fishing subsidies, right? So it right. has to be specifically towards the fishery. Unless, unless, I, unless I suppose it's teaching them how to fish. Yeah, that would be a different category. <laughs> <laughs> Which we don't necessarily own. Um, so this is kind of pulling out a little bit and kind of circles back to how I framed the conversation at the top. But um, Darsh Fatsa asks, um, uh, I think this question is a little out of context, but what's the case with sustainable fishing, especially since the term is being thrown around in negative light since the conspiracy came in? So like, is it sort of possible? And if yes, what could be the base objective of such a thing? So I realize that's kind of broader than this conversation, but how does this term sustainable fishing um, fit into the su subsidies conversation? Like if, some, if a fishery is getting huge amounts of subsidy that is maybe keeping it alive when it need or shouldn't be alive, is that no longer sustainable? I can go ahead and, and take the first pass at this. Yeah. So we, we all love the question of sustainable, but I, I, in terms of fishing, sustainable can have many meanings. Often, I think most of us would consider it uh, to mean that the fishery is is being fished at or below the limit upon which it could continue to kind of yield the same catch year after year. So it's not being fished beyond that point. And that is one, one place in which subsidies could cause a fishery to be unsustainable. As, as Daniel mentioned, uh, these types of fisheries subsidies encourage fishing often beyond the level that would otherwise be able to be maintained year after year without requiring increases in fishing effort. So in that way, yes, uh, fisheries that are being heavily subsidized by capacity enhancing subsidies could be unsustainable. Um, there are other definitions of sustainability in regards to fisheries, things like bycatch, um, 
but I, I think the role that subsidies plays is more tied to the first. Good. Thank you. Um, Daniel, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I was just going to add that, um, yeah, so sus sustainable fishing, as, as Kat said, I think we all agree it is possible. Uh, sometimes, you know, this is the theory and then the practice right behind this. Um, I think one of the things that maybe you mentioned Sea Spiracy probably did highlight is that while sustainable fishing is possible in that it can carry on indefinitely, you know, certain fisheries have been around for millennia, um, impact-free fishing is probably impossible. In right. that the, the whole point of fishing is you are extracting and killing some of nature in the very act of fishing. And so I think it's important to realize that impact-free fishing is probably impossible. You're always going to have an impact. And uh, sustainability isn't about whether you're having an imp impact or not. It's about in our definition, as Kat said, is about whether it can continue, you know, indefinitely, really. Well, I, you know, I go back to that really slap in the face uh, couple of slides you showed, Daniel, where, you know, all the bright red biomass goes into sort of a, an expansive empty blue over the course of 100 years. And I suppose it's a bit of a sliding bar. Like right now, we're slid way over where uh, most things have been largely emptied of biomass and we want to slide it back. And I guess, you know, somewhere in there is at the point at which we're doing benefit to humanity, right? To, and or the, the degree of benefit that we want from that. And so I think we're, you know, we've gradually we were way over here, we're sliding back here, but we're still in my overview. Anyway, we're still kind of over here. And we need to slide more towards the center. Um, one thing uh, that's come up uh, in the question is, you know, somebody asked, um, uh, what would happen if all harmful subsidies are removed? And you know, to me, I wonder if this is analogous to the sort of fossil fuel debate to some degree. Like, you know, for the longest time, um, automakers, you know, were raising gas efficiency standards, and then this just this last year, everyone's suddenly saying they're going to go fully electric, and we're going to build um, renewable energy capacity, and that there's kind of a flipping point to all of this. So, are are fishery subsidies kind of like fossil fuels in the sense that we all deep in our bones know that the large majority of them have to go away? And if they were to go away, like what would happen? What would, would what would what's your prediction? Is there is that completely unscientific question to ask? Anyone drive in at their risk. <laughs> I'm gonna pass this to Kat, I think. <laughs> um, I can't say that I've ever I've ever thought of it from the from the fossil fuel angle. Um, and I I'm not sure that they're completely analogous. I mean, as we've touched on, there are ways to support fisheries that are not harmful. Um, Whereas which I think the, the debate about fossil fuels is a little bit more to do, do away with their use altogether. Um, whereas our argument is really more to, to support fisheries in a way that you're not incentivizing overcapacity and overfishing. Um, and so I think we, we and others have done, done some modeling work on this front uh, and, and the results are promising that removing capacity enhancing subsidies could have really meaningful effects on both fish stock biomass, like the number of fish in the water, uh, as well as ultimately fisheries catches. So fishermen would actually be able to extract more fish from the ocean with less fishing effort uh, if we did, did away with all capacity enhancing subsidies. Interesting. Now, how would you, so, all right, so here we are in this summer of coming out of COVID. Um, maybe there might actually be an in-person meeting of uh, some of these people negotiating this whole thing. Um, James uh, from, from EJN asks, you know, what, how would you rate the likelihood of a WTO treaty and what should journalists keep an eye on as the negotiations progress? Like if you're going to write a story, which by the way, um, there is some grant money out there from EJN to fund stories on this thing. What, what should they be looking at? Um, to try and kind of keep those bureaucrats doing what they're supposed to be doing and focusing on the right target here. Uh, shall I jump in? Yes, um, please. So, I mean, I think Kat may know better than me about the likelihood of a WTO treaty. I think from what I can tell, it seems like there's a good chance there's a new director general of the WTO who's very passionate and driven about this particular issue. 
and, 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 and you know, documents are starting to be informed by the WTO members that are, that are edging towards some kind of agreement, um, which would be incredible, which would be really positive. Um, I say, um, you know, I'm, I'm often maybe pessimistic in my view, but um, I do think the story doesn't end there when there's an agreement, and I do think scrutiny needs to continue. Um, what we don't want is to have an agreement uh, on paper that doesn't actually help to remove this 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 misuse of public money, right? So, um, you know, just just because we've got an agreement doesn't mean the problem is going to go away. And you know, I see it as getting a, a, an agreement in June or July as the first step along the process of actually removing fishery subsidies, not the not the ending. Um, and I don't know whether the other two have got more to add to that. Kat, Anna. <laughs> I'll just I'll, I'll just quickly build on what Daniel said. I I think my view is very similar. I am optimistic that there hopefully will be an an agreement this year. I think there's still some room um, for kind of what that agreement is to be to be determined. And what I mean by that is is how ambitious that agreement actually ends up being. And so I think. I think a role that you as journalists and others in the public can play on that is by helping to helping to keep this issue kind of at the forefront of your government's attention, um, putting pressure on policymakers, governments, uh, and expressing that this is an important issue. Um, and as Daniel said, that that will likely go on long after an agreement is reached, um, but really the more attention that can be paid to this, the better. It just really highlights the importance of, of governments reaching agreement on this. Thanks. Um, just uh, organizational point of order. Um, we still have a fair amount of participants on board. So I think I'm gonna let this go till about um, 10, 15 Eastern time. So another like seven minutes or so, cause we still have a bunch of questions I'd like to get to. Um, one of the questions um, that came up was, do we have any data on um, large scale and small scale sc subsidy skewed by country? Like, do we know, like, you know, if some of the individual journalists are looking at their country and what they want to know, you know, what they, you know, if they're going to appeal to their editors in their country, is that data accessible somewhere? Yeah, it is. We have it split up by each country and each region. Um, I can show the, the paper in a second as well. That's open access where this data is available. Oh, great. You'll put yeah. that up on the chat? Yeah, I will in a second. I'll put the other one up. I'll do this one in a moment. Sure, um, sure. Uh, I, I was just going to um, quickly add, though, if it's OK, to this previous discussion. Yeah. Um, just about, um, so the harmful fishery subsidies, if we take them away, I think there's, um, and the world trade negotiations. So I agree. I think um, there's a good chance. I think to keep in mind for journals too is the um, nuances in all of this, right? So we have like, we all talk from a very um, biological perspective and we talk about um, how stocks recover when we take those harmful fishery subsidy away. But I also want to highlight how complex the whole social and social economic um, situation is and how, um, how this is often this big argument why there is no no agreement because not everybody can agree on the same thing they're talking about who's going to be ex like where there's exceptions for developing countries for especially for the least developed countries and how this does all work and um i think it's important again to keep in mind not just who provides these subsidies but also who's impacted by these subsidies and that we just think about the long term which is really important because we need to work towards having healthy oceans otherwise nobody's going to win so whatever their negotiations are and how complex it is. Um, I think the push is kind of the same for everybody, but there's the, the short term needs that are making it so complex. Um, that is so hard to like, how can you think about in the future if you just need to figure out how to feed your people right now, right? And, um, but yeah, it needs to be somehow addressed and there needs to be money put into these communities to survive and to have food. And that is not time for fishing subsidies, right? So just kind of Thank to you. go back into the nuances. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one question that isn't so nuanced, um, 
Uh, Inga Smith asks, how would you stop China from creating new islands to extend their territorial limits and fishing grounds, which is, you know, those who, who are coming to the call may or may not know that countries have um, an exclusive economic zone up to, I think, 200 nautical miles from shore. Um, this question, I realize, may not be within the context of this panel to discuss, but, but it does bring up the question of China, which I think, Daniel, in one of the papers you sent me, um, am, am I getting it right? Something like 20% of all subsidies globally are coming from the People's Republic of China. So where does China fit in all this? We know that there have been issues with China in relation to the WTO. Can, is China on board for this? Um, are they ready to, you know, since they're probably going to take the biggest hit um, nationally if, if um, these kind of large scale subsidies go, um, what's the status of that? People on the inside line on that? Uh, I, can, I can start. Uh, yeah, the, the issue with, um, you know, the expansion of territorial seas or, or, or disputed territorial seas is, is a little out of my uh, comfort zones to, to, to talk about, really. Um, it does make it complex when we're trying to do research, uh, um, as, as I've been finding out, when you start trying to allocate, you know, fish or, or subsidies to certain parts of the ocean when, when they're disputed. But unfortunately, that's out of my uh, area of, of knowledge, really. Um, just in terms of the role that China play on the international scene, yes, they're by far the largest provider of fishery subsidies. Uh, I think it's around $6 billion of harmful fishery subsidies out of the $22 billion is, is, is estimated to come from China. Um, it's important to note as well, they also have by far the largest fishing fleet in the world. Um, so, you know, they, they also catch by far the largest amount of fish. Um, we've just recently been doing some work where we've been trying to kind of take that into account when we talk about the, the role that individual nations or, or regions play on, on, on the international scene, taking, you know, m mentioning that fishery subsidies can cause harm. It's not just about the size of the subsidies. It's also about the size of the subsidy in relation to the size of the fishery, right? So if you've got a small fishery that's only catching a few hundred thousand dollars worth of fish every year, which could be, you know, a, a really important fishery. If you're, if, you're, if you're still providing subsidies, that can still have an impact on on, on, on overcapacity, on allowing fishing to go beyond those, you know, biological and economic limits. So it's difficult to, when you talk about subsidies, it's not just, you know, the big dollar, $6 billion raises alarms and gets headlines, but, you know, there's more to it underneath that as well. So yeah, um, China are on board with these negotiations, they're within them. As I say, it's not, I'm not, I'm not fully across uh, exactly, exactly the role that they're playing, but um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. I kind of skirted the actual question quite. Well, I mean, you know, I think it's interesting. And I actually think, you know, for those of us, uh, the journalists on the line who, you know, within the scope of their reporting or can cover China, I think it's an excellent point of entry, right, to try and dig a little deeper and understand what are the dynamics there. Um, Rather than getting the other two comments, there's a, uh, other two of you to comment on that. I want to just get to another question that um, Masanori Kobayashi asks. Um, can we, and I think it's a really important point, can we have a multilateral mechanism to verify that the countries are actually reducing and eliminating harmful subsidies, you know, provided we get an agreement in place? I mean, I always think about what Callum Roberts, the great writer on ocean issues, he often refers to the network of MPAs, marine protected areas in, British, in Britain as, as the paper parks. So, What's to keep this from just being a paper agreement and not an actual agreement? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question. And this is one of the, the things about the WTO that is especially interesting is the WTO has an internal kind of dispute process, which is slightly unique for an international organization. Um, for instance, many international fisheries uh, regional management organizations do not have this type of process, but the WTO does internally allow for countries to kind of file and investigate disputes amongst one another. Um, I won't, I won't make any claims about the necessary outcomes of those, but I think it is a good first step 
Um, but that question really does underscore Daniel's earlier point that this will be a, a continuing issue after any agreement is reached um, to keep keep countries accountable and keep working towards this issue. Yeah, and, and just to kind of add to that is that it's going to be difficult to kind of to have a mechanism to hold them you know to account for for any agreement that we get as a, going back to my earlier comment about you know the intention and, and outcome is that if we have certain subsidies that are listed as prohibited you know there can be ways around these stills you know to, to to be able to continue to support you know indirectly harmful fishery subsidies and so i think as i said any negotiate any agreement will be will be the starting point for removing harmful fishery subsidies it won't be the end point and that you know this agreement although we all really welcome it, you know, it's not a silver bullet. And even if we were able to get rid of all fishery subsidies, you know, this is one component that's holding us back from having fully sustainable fisheries. This isn't gonna solve that entirely. As Kat said, you know, we still need to, you know, look at fisheries management, how we do that. You know, the fish that we that we target, the fish we don't target, you know, and, and also the, the, the methods that we use to target these fish, you know, whether they're impacting uh, non-target species and things like that. So fishery subsidies is just, for us anyway, it seems like just an egregious use of public money, one that we feel could be quite easily solved by governments, you know, redirect that money, you know, and then we can start moving forward, it's, you know, towards trying to get sustainable fisheries across all of the world's oceans. All right, well, you know, there are a couple of outstanding questions, but I feel like that they were kind of covered and might take us further afield. And, and I like kind of the idea of ending on an egregious misuse of public resources um, being, you know, really something to, I think, journalists um, who are on the call could really focus on um, going forward. Um, how, you know, this is your money ultimately. And, um, you know, do you want to be paying for overfishing? Do you want to be paying for harming the oceans that we all love and hold dear to our hearts? And you know, do you want to make uh, fishing cheaper for large multinational corporations that um, are to some extent using this, the, um, the sea's wealth to enrich the, you know, their, own, their own corporate interests? So you know, this is a way of, you know, I think there's been a lot of debate about democracy in the last year and how you can personally be involved and how you can have a stake in the future of, of, of your society, but also your planet and also your ecosystems around you. And I think this is actually a really key moment for people to get involved. So um, I want to thank our panelists so much uh, for participating. Thanks to the Earth Journalism Network um, for being um, really a great uh, supporter of what could have been a pretty obtuse uh, conversation, but actually ended up being pretty focused. Um, again, for those of you who want to join the Earth Journalism Network, if you go to earthjournalism.net, um, that would be a great way for you to partake. And you, um, you will, um, if you're on this call, you'll get emailed um, the, uh, the recording of this webinar. I also wanna remind you that this is one of an ongoing series of discussions um, about fishery subsidies. Um, there are few, um, more will be added to the schedule, but the one that we have in the schedule right now is May 13th um, at 10 a.m. IST, that's Indian India Standard Time IST. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit ignorant of my uh, temporal abbreviations. Um, but that's going to focus, um, I believe, um, on uh, on fishery subsidies in that part of the world. Um, and there are going to be others on the Caribbean, uh, Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, and Japan, all obviously in those local languages. So yes, um, it's not just an English language only uh, universe here. It's a very, very multinational, multilingual, um, very complicated debate. So thanks for, for making this clear. Um, I guess that's about it. So um, I will, um, and, and those of you actually who wanna uh, stay in touch with me personally, if you go to my website, paulgreenberg.org, um, that's where I uh, post my work. Um, there's an opportunity to log questions in there. I continue to write about fishery stuff, but just a small plug, I have this book out called The Climate Diet. That's out now and I'm touring around about that, but I'll leave that to the side. Um, but but I'm also on Twitter and shows you my roots. I'm at Fourfish Greenberg. So please feel free to ping me on Twitter. And all of you folks, um, all, everyone on the panel, I think, are, are you all three on Twitter? or on social media in some way, shape or form. Okay, so yeah, so if you actually, I think I think you're all tagged in the webinar um, a, a promotion that was went out over Twitter. So people can, I think, ping you guys um, with follow-up questions and things like that. But thank you all for really hard work, um, very, uh, you know, 
it's not it's always hard i think to focus on one issue for a very long time and really follow it through its all of its byzantine baroque um permutations so i really appreciate your time thanks there's journalism network thanks for all the participants and i guess we'll you know we'll see you as these negotiations progress and hope to see lots of oh i should say one last plug for please submit um, your story ideas and try to get some of those grants to do individual stories about um, fishery subsidies. We'd love to read them. I certainly will read them. So it's, you know, I think this, the, the door is wide open to keep this conversation going. So thanks very much and we'll be in touch. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye.